This week we're going to be speaking in James chapter 4, and uh, some of this is not uh, easy material. Some of it's material that uh, is very serious, but we're going to address it today because we're going to teach the Word of God, amen? The last week we spoke of what? Heavenly wisdom exercised by peacemakers. That type of wisdom that brings forth a harvest of righteousness, as we should be searching for a harvest of righteousness in our life. A wisdom that is pure. A wisdom that is genuine. I was encouraged in Sunday school this morning to hear uh, much of the lesson, talking about some of these very things, as uh, you guys were talking about that. It was very encouraging. But what did we also see? We also saw that there is, in contrast to that kind of wisdom, an earthly wisdom that issues all sorts of disorder, all forms of evil. That earthly, worldly wisdom on full display is in our passage this morning as James continues his subject by looking at those who show no wisdom from above, by looking at how they live. And thus, far from being peacemakers, they were not peacemakers. They were involved in personal wars, personal strife amongst themselves, arguing and quarreling, okay? Who here likes arguing and quarreling? <laughs> no one really likes fighting. <laughs> no one likes arguing or turmoil and unrest, especially if we are believers. In our heart of hearts, if we get right into our hearts and our renewed spirits, we want peace. We want peace. We do not want war. We want contentment. We want harmony, not constant unrest, not constant fighting or arguing or bickering. But sadly, however, conflict and anger far too often erupt amongst God's people, and they are major issues in far too many marriages, in far too many relationships, in far too many areas where we deal with people where there's this type of disruption. Do you know what the most successful results of counseling are? What do you think they may be? It's the counseling where the person receives truthful, godly counsel, listens to that counsel, makes the changes to incorporate that counsel, and follows it with a willing heart. That is successful counseling. Amen? In our passage this morning, James puts his finger on the problem. It was their spiritual infidelity and more importantly the solution that they had a need of humility before God that they might know peace, that they might know joy. So today we're going to hear from James who is speaking the words of God. As Isaiah 9, 6, we know him as the wonderful counselor himself, right? God is the wonderful counselor. We're going to see God's program for genuine peace and joy. Is that exciting? All right. And starting, let's please turn to James 4, 1 through 10. Lord, I just pray this morning that we will listen to these words, that we will be honest as we look in our lives, that, Lord, as we see this plan, anywhere that we're weak, we ask you to expose it to us, to show us, to allow us to submit to you in all things, and please you in all we do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So James 4, 1 through 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world because becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Woo! Tough scripture. What's it say? In these verses, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on in the beginning, James addresses the source of their strife, the source of their hostility, namely your desires or your pleasures that battle within you. What causes these fights? What causes these quarrels? You do. They come from within you. They come from your desires and your pleasures. This word for desires is always used in the New Testament in the negative sense. Always. 1 Peter 2.11 tells us to abstain from these sinful desires, which what? Which wage war within us. The regenerated man against the sin nature. And it wages war within us. These people were not wanting God's gentle wisdom. God's peace-loving wisdom. They weren't wanting that. They each wanted their own selfish, sinful way. They want things, but they don't get them. Because they ask with wrong intentions. They covet what others have, but they cannot have them. They ask, but their selfish prayers were going unanswered by God. They were fighting. They were quarreling. They were hating. Kill. Their pleasures, their uh, pleasure-oriented lives were filled with dissatisfaction. They weren't necessarily killing one another, but remember, Jesus, if you hate a brother in your heart, you commit murder. He's, James is going to the heart of the issue. Wow. True peace and joy were really unknown. James calls this worldliness. It's, it has a very serious name. Adultery. Spiritual infidelity to Christ Jesus. You should be our first and only love. He calls it adultery. Wow. Infidelity. James, are you serious? Is this really the case, James? Look at verses 4 and 5. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? James points out that all their anger, conflict, and dissatisfaction was the evidence of a much greater problem. It was the byproduct of a big problem, the real issue, namely their infidelity to Jesus Christ. He calls them, you adulterous people. In studying this and writing this, looking at this, talking with my dad about this, just contemplating this, have we ever considered the possibility that we commit spiritual infidelity or that we can live lives in adultery to God? When's the last time we've lived our lives and said, man, I'm committing adultery? spiritually have you ever even considered that am i doing this is that even a concept that enters the mind of the believer and james says you adulterous people imagine just imagine how that would go over today if a pastor spoke like that you adulterous people in today's society that'd be unloving that would be insensitive it would be callous would it not that's what, that's what the charges would be. You remember when Israel, who had made a covenant with God, when they began to worship other gods and adopt the lifestyles of the nations around them, God charged them with adultery. Remember, James is the first book written in the New Testament, and James speaks a lot in the Old Testament language. It's just as relevant. We, I heard in Sunday school today that the Bible is just as relevant today. Today, what is it? The union of the believer to Christ is likened to a marriage. Remember, we see that in Romans 7, 4. 
The church is the bride, and Christ is the bridegroom. He is the head, and he is the husband. We know that from Ephesians 5, amen? You see, our Lord has the right to expect all of our love, all of our loyalty, all of our devotion. God, my Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who died for me, who died for you, should be the first and only love above all other in our lives. In living to please themselves and in living for pleasure, they were living like the world around them, where the lordship of Jesus Christ was not recognized. They were befriending the enemy of the Lord rather than being faithful to the Lord. They were succumbing to worldly wisdom rather than tapping into God's wisdom from above. These people were more interested in being a friend of the world than being faithful to the Lord. And that's a danger we all must recognize. When we begin to live in such a way that our pleasures, our pursuits, our wills, that they become paramount in our life, then our behavior betrays something. It betrays the fact that we are playing around on our Lord and we have another lover, the world. Wow, James. Thank you for saying that so I could just say what you're saying. Have we ever looked at that? You see, the devotion and love we ought to give to the Lord are being given to another person, another entity, world. The pleasure and the satisfaction we ought to find in Jesus Christ alone is being sought in something else to take the place of the Lord. When our devotion, love, and loyalty are being given to the Lord, that's what makes Him happy. But when we are giving it to another other than the Lord, when it's sought in another, the world, that is what the Bible says, spiritual unfaithfulness. And James says, you adulterous people. You see, the true believer, such unfaithfulness, guess what? It will never bring satisfaction. It only will bring dead ends of disillusion, disillusionment and dead ends of grief and misery. It takes you nowhere good. Dysfunction will be riddled throughout your family. Dysfunction will be riddled inside your life. Your relationships, though outwardly people may look at it, you thinking you're all there. Inwardly, you know they're broken. You will have broken relationships will abound in your life. And troubles and sorrows will follow you everywhere you can go because you're buying into something that is deceiving you. The Holy Spirit and the true believer, what is he? He is jealous for this devotion. He's jealous for this love in a, in a godly way, not sinful. We can't attach no sin to the Holy Spirit. This jealousy is pure, and it ought to be the Lord's alone, all of our devotion. Without it, it will come... Until we do that, he will continually produce turmoil in our life, a constant unrest, a constant dissatisfaction if we truly have the Holy Spirit inside of us if we're not living faithful. It's called conviction. So now James warns them that friends of the world, guys, are not friends of God. They're actually at enmity with him. And if it continues, are his enemies, ultimately. You see, it's impossible to walk in spiritual fellowship with God and at the same time follow the world. How many have tried it? Don't raise your hand. It doesn't work. It's impossible. To remain on the world's path is to ultimately perish with the world in the end. So what has James been saying to us up till now? James has already said, you claim to have genuine faith, but I don't see it in your deeds or your works. You claim to have a godly tongue, but I don't see it in your words. Who among you is wise? You claim to be wise, but I don't see it in your wisdom. And not in your worldliness either, is what he's saying. But I love the word but. But, praise the Lord, we do not have to live in such conflict. We do not have to live with this type of infighting. 
We don't have to live with this type of dissatisfaction, do we? We do not have to continue to be adulterous people spiritually. We do not have to be uh, doing infidelity with the Lord. It does not have to happen. It does not have to take place. And if it is, great blessing from God, we have the ability to change. We do not have to continue in unfaithfulness. God jealously desires our love and our devotion, and he calls us to come home, and he promises us something. The grace to do it. Verse 6, but he gives more grace, greater grace. Amen? We should love that word. We should love that promise. Thank God I have greater grace. Wow. What is this greater grace? This is grace in its active power. This is the supernatural, overflowing, abundant enablement of God through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us to have the ability to live victoriously. I have that. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, say, I have it too. Greater grace. Greater grace than what? More grace for what? Greater grace than our sin of unfaithfulness? Yes, praise God. Greater grace than the attraction of the world? Yes. Greater grace than the warring sinful desires of the flesh within me? Absolutely. Greater grace than the demands of total love and devotion to the Lord? Yes. You see, in every situation in our life, praise God, and all the demands to love the Lord and be loyal to Him, there is a greater grace of God to do that. Amen? Because we can overcome the battle within, the flesh. We can overcome the world without. And we can overcome the devil from below. I'm so thankful for that. You see, grace is waiting on high. Victory lies within our grasp. We have a greater grace from our Lord. But how do we get there? Here's where the wonderful counselor is going to come in and tell you. Listen to God. He's going to give you a path. It all begins with something mankind has always battled. Humility. Humble yourself. He gives grace to the humble. James says in verse 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, this is shown when Paul, when Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Do you want peace and joy in your life? Do you want to be close to the Lord? And know what real Christianity is all about? Listen to uh, Micah 6.8. This is said centuries earlier. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. James is now going to give ten imperatives on what that involves. Here we go. Just lay back on the count, couch of the wonderful counselor. If we do these things, peace, joy, love, wisdom, usefulness, purpose, and all the blessings the Lord has in store for you will be yours. You want those things? Look at verses 7 through 10, chapter 4. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Step one, number one. Now, I know you're thinking in your head right now, oh, my word, he does have ten. We're going to get through them quick. <laughs> Step one. Submit to God. Submit to God. Job 22, 21 says, Submit to God and you will have peace with Him. Some of that was being talked about in Sunday school this morning. Here we go, path to peace. 
and joy, submit to God. This principle runs true from Bible cover to cover. Amen? Listen now. Submission is not the same as obedience. It precedes it. Submission is the surrender of one's will, which then leads to obedience. Submission precedes obedience. It's the first thing we do is submit ourselves and our will to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We must get the big I, the big self, away from thinking we are kings and queens of our lives and we have to surrender the control of our lives to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Far too often, we're like this. Far too less often are we in submission. There was a professor who once addressed a ministerium and he's told the story of Admiral Nelson's victory over the French Sea. When the French captain, who was defeated, extended his hand to Nelson in defeat to congratulate him for his great seamanship, Nelson first uh, did this, and I quote, First your sword, then your hand. You get it? I'll gladly shake your hand. First give me your sword. We must all ask ourselves, what sword in my life must I submit to the Lord before I can enjoy full fellowship and intimacy with him. Here are a few verses of many that you can look up later as you ask yourself that question. Take a pic of these, write them down. I'll pause for a moment because I'm not going there. Do this in your own study. Romans 10.3, 1 Corinthians 16.16, James 4.7, 1 Peter 2.13, Ephesians 5.21. And you can then exhaustively search the Bible on God's will to submit. I gave you a start. So first, submit to God. Next two, resist the devil. James again shows us that behind all sin, behind all selfishness, there is this devil and his demons we saw in 3.15 and hell 3.6. We, my friends, are at war. Satan is not all-powerful, and therefore he has no power over you. Did you know that? He only has the power you give to him or allow him to have. We get this reversed all too often. We resist God and submit to the devil, submit to the sin nature. That's the reverse. Submit to God to his, for his, uh, to his grace and power. We know Paul tells us to put on the armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and his strength, Ephesians 6. So we must resist the devil. And when you do, you and God will put him to flight. Amen? We need to man and woman up spiritually. God's grace is more than sufficient for us. And he will give greater grace to submit to him. And he will give greater grace to resist the devil if that is our heart's desire. And you have that power. Three, draw near to God. This is what God wants. He wants us to draw near to him. That is grace alone that he should even want us around him. Praise God. We tend to reverse this also. We tend to say, if I only had a real sense of his presence, if I only could hear something from him, I would spend more time in his word, in worship and prayer. We put the promise that he will draw near to you before the command that you're to draw near to him. That's that's a trick by Satan. He's going to trick you there until God draws near to me. No. That's his promise. His command is you draw near to me. You come where I'm at. Hey, come over here. Uh Uh-uh. Come over here. Come here. Draw near to me. Wow, that's what we need to do. We need to have a desire for that. When we lack intimacy with God, it is because to some degree, We are living unfaithfully. 
to some degree, worldliness is in us. Self is in the way. If your marriage is crumbling to some degree, there's worldliness in it. If your friendships are crumbling to some degree, there is worldliness in it. If your relationship with the Lord is stale and it's not there to some degree, there is worldliness in it. We're not drawing near to God. You see, drawing near to God means purification, developing your personal relationship with God through the disciplines of the faith. And we see that in Exodus 30, 19, Matthew 7, 7, Revelation 3, 20. You see, ultimately, we are responsible for our spiritual growth. God provides the plan. Christ is the way, and the Spirit is the guidance, however. We provide the will of our hearts from our humbleness before God and further exhibit it with our hands and our feet as it becomes action. That's what it's all about. Amen? Draw near to Him how? We need to be in His Word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in fellowship with the saints and in the fellowship of the sharing of His suffering. Philippians 3.10, what Paul said. There is nothing like being in the Word of God on a daily basis to commune with Him. There is nothing like a prayer life that is God-centered and not me-focused that will bring us in deeper fellowship with Him. There is nothing like fellowshipping with the saints, edifying one another as we serve Him, that will bring us closer to God. There is nothing like fellowship in the sharing of His suffering. There is nothing like sharing the the gospel of Jesus Christ and experiencing Jesus' persecution, however slight, that will draw you closer to your Savior's heart. There is nothing like faithful service within the body of Christ and serving others inside the church and serving others outside of the church. When you share Him, serve Him, serve others, you will fellowship in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And you'll love it. Because you're going to be right there with the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Amen? He will draw near to you when that's your desire. He will enrich you with the grace of his presence and you will testify just like the psalmist said, as for me, as for me, it is good to be near to God, Psalm 73, 28. And then you will experience in his presence what the world can never give you, the world will never give you, the fullness of joy and the pleasures forever, Psalm 1611. That's truth. That's the Bible. Don't believe the lie. Don't you want that? I want that. John 14, 23, write that one down. The potential for intimacy in that verse alone is beyond our imagination. I'm going to leave that one for you to go look up and marvel over. You see, you can go do some more study on this. Marvel over that, John 14, 24. Four, wash your hands. Wash your hands. This is, look at that hand. I thought that was funny. I like that hand. Y'all like that? It's supposed to represent germs, but I just decided it represents sins. All right? (laughs) Wash your dirty hands. This is the command to clean up our outer life. Clean up those areas in which you sinfully live. Clean up those areas in which you know you are defiled. Clean up those areas in which you know you're dirty. Isaiah 1, 15 through 6, wonderful counselors talking. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing what is wrong. God. Whoo! Wash your hands. You want peace and joy? My dear person who I love, wash your hands. Stop doing what is wrong. And I'm not going to listen to you until you do. Stop doing wrong, words of God. Stop living with worldliness. I'm here to tell you, this is not popular today, and I'm sure many will disagree with me right now, that you do not have to spend six months on a counselor's couch. Just stop it. 
That's what God says. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say you do not have greater grace to recognize sin and have the Holy Spirit come into your life and help change you. Now, I agree with counseling. And I agree that we have to teach the Word of God. We may have to bring people up who need help or can't see something. I'm not disagreeing with counseling. But you know what? That is, in essence, the end game to stop it. This is not popular counsel in today's modern psychology. Nevertheless, it is ultimately the bottom line. And God gives greater grace to do it. That's what God said. I'm thankful for that. So please, I want to go on record. If you need counseling for me, I'm more than happy to do it. And I want to do it. Because sometimes sin gets in our life. It muddles us up. We don't think straight. We don't have the Lord where it needs to be and we're confused. But ultimately, you're going to have to get to a point where you submit to God. Where you resist the devil. Where you wash your hands. And where you draw near to God and say, I'm going to stop it. Right? Five, purify your hearts. We saw the outward, wash your hands. Now, purify your hearts. This is the inner life. Look at your thoughts. Look at your motives. Evaluate them. Are they in line with the wisdom from above? We talked about those seven character traits last week. Are they in line? This means that submission to God produces humbleness, which then produces a right attitude and a right motive. Amen? Who do we really love is the question. Notice here, James refers to them as double-minded, as he did in chapter 1-8, when they were unstable in all their ways. Here is the person whose affection towards God is divided. At one time, he claims that, that claims Christ and has loyalty to Christ, claiming that on one occasion, and then turns an about face to love the world. He's double-minded. He's unstable. This word is the word for hypocrite or hypocrisy. And when James was writing this to these Jews, they did not like the name hypocrite. They hated hypocrisy. It was a very hard uh, statement to make towards them. Double-minded. So He says, purify your heart. Get rid of the impurity. Get rid of the uh, divided allegiance. You see, Elijah's call back in Elijah's day is still just as valid today in 1 Kings 18.21. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. We don't have the right to say nothing. We have to choose. We have to follow God. We must make a choice and not be double-minded. Psalm 139, 23 through 24 is a good starting place. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. Let me start there. Let me start right there, Lord. He will give you a greater grace if that is your heart's desire. Six, seven, eight, and nine. You see, I told you it wasn't going to take that long. We're going to go six, seven, eight, and nine. Boom, there they are. Grieve, mourn, wail, and change. Grieve, mourn, wail, and change. Remember that. Grieve, mourn, wail, and change. James is not laying down what should be the characteristic the characteristic lifestyle of the believer. Let's look at the context. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Here is the call to repent for their sins for true, authentic repentance. When we do wrong, which we do, we will realize from the law written on our hearts that we did wrong from God's Word, from the Holy Spirit in us, we will feel remorse and guilt if we are drawing near to God. If we are doing these things, we will feel it. We will see it and we'll grieve over it. It means to express grief for our sins. How many are going through life these last two or three weeks? When's the last time 
you grieved, heartbroken over sin. Wow. We must see the heinousness of sin and in humbleness and honesty sincerely be upset when it exists within us or we exercise it. Exercise it. We have to seek forgiveness and then we can fully accept His grace and we can fully accept His forgiveness with no more shame as He will wipe it away and forget about it. Amen? Amen? This is about their worldliness and about their unfaithfulness, their fighting and their quarreling, their pride, their envy, etc. And it seems that they were having fun, laughter, and joy in their friendship with the world. Just as laughter is an outward expression of joy, so grieving, mourning, and wailing is an inward-to-outward expression as well. If we're playing around in the world, it's not a laughing matter. James is saying we must change in our heart that sees sin, hates it, that grieves over it, rather than laughs at it in rebellion. A serious thing if not changed. In Luke 6.25, Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Praise God for His grace. Praise God for His mighty salvation. I will never eternally mourn and weep. I have victory. I have salvation. Amen. But when I see what put Jesus Christ on the cross, when I see what was my debt, when I saw what my wage is, when I see what sin has done to the world, when it enters me and I have the Holy Spirit dwelling within me, I should grieve over it. And I should have a heart to repent. Jesus will speak of this type of action again in James 5.1. Layman Straw said, The Bible is the most joyful book in the world. And Christianity, the most joyful religion. But the real abiding joy of the cleansed and forgiven sinner can only come after deep sorrow for sin. What brings people to Christ? When sin reigns and our love for the Lord wanes, it is time to repent. It is not time to laugh. Do you all agree? Jesus said in Revelation 2.4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Unfaithfulness. Repent means to completely and utterly turn away from our desires and deeds and towards His love and towards His plan. Real, authentic repentance is sincere. Godly wisdom, we saw that. We will regret our behavior and we will be on guard in the future in our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And our lifestyle will change and he will change us and help us be impactful in other people's lives. The last one, number 10. You're going to say, well, you already said this. But this was number 10. Humble yourselves. James comes back full circle now to where he started in verse 6. We're coming to a close now. The humbling James calls for in this context is that of repentance for their sinful pride of living for themselves and not under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Repentance for the sinful pride of loving themselves more than loving the Lord, seeking their own desires and their own pleasures rather than living to please the Lord and His pleasures. It's the pride of self-exaltation, which is the breakdown of our society. It is the breakdown of our homes. It is the breakdown of relationships. It's the exalting of self. It breaks our marriages down and destroys them. It breaks our relationship with our children and destroys them. It breaks relationship within the church and destroys them. It brings false testimony to the world and destroys those relationships before they ever begin. And on it goes. But most sadly to me, it hinders the relationship with God. We kind of say, I don't want to spend life proudly focused on me. We can't spend life proudly focused on yourself, your wants, your ways, your pleasures. You see, God, we're told, is opposed to the proud. Guess what? We're just going to lose that battle 
Wisdom says if I'm going to fight a battle, I can't win. I'm not going to fight it. We're going to lose that battle. You will never find real peace and joy living for yourself. Man, if we could just believe that and not fall victim to the lies of the world and Satan, I'm never going to find real peace and joy living for me. I'm only going to find it living for him. Humble yourself before the Lord, he says, and he will lift you up. Amen. This is a promise. The Bible does not say specifically what this means, but we know that one day all those who humble themselves to receive Jesus' Lord and seek to serve him will be lifted to glory. Amen. But I believe God lifts the humble today. Right here in your present life, he will lift you up. To those who humbly seek him, first, he lifts above the cares and the anxieties of this world, Matthew 6, 33 through 34, and he gives rest for your soul. The grace of God lifts the humble above their own weaknesses and infuses them with the power of God to live victoriously for Christ's sake, 2 Corinthians 9, 7-10. through 10. The humble are lifted above the confused. They're lifted above the conflicted of the world because God teaches the humble His ways and He guides them in what is right. Psalm 25, 9. He lifts you up. When we come to the end of ourselves, when we submit to our Lord, when we seek to please Him and be loyal to Him, He will rise us to heights where our pride can never come. You want to go there? In closing, let's put Him first in our life. Isaiah 57, 15. For this is what the High and Exalted One says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He will lift you up. God lives in two places. Let's open our hearts to him. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hands. Open your heart to God. Submit to him. Let him be the potter and shape your life to his design. He will lift you up. Isaiah 64, 4. From days of old, they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. We can trust him to work in his ways in our life in ways we've never dreamed of, in humility, He will lift you up. In the Bible, the way up to God is down. Humble ourselves. Do not allow the immediate, attractive, and passive things of the world blind you to the far greater compensations that God promises to those who only love and serve Him. Praise God. What we need to do is choose your allegiance. Cultivate your fellowship with God and clean up your life. The path to peace and joy, real intimacy with the Lord. I want to be clay in his hands. Let our prayer be that God can center us on him that he can do as he sees fit with us, that we will submit ourselves to him, that we will yield to him, that we will wash our hands, that we will have a desire to draw near to him, that we will grieve over our sin and repent. And God's going to flood into and use that as he draws near to us. And that is where we're going to find true peace and true joy in our life. Amen. Dear Lord, I just thank you for these words, Lord. They're definitely convicting. But Lord, as we see them, they're full of grace. You give a greater grace not to live like the world, not to live like we used to live, not to be bombarded with worldliness. But through your greater grace, through you 
we have the power to grow in knowledge and intimacy with you. Lord, let us submit to you. Let us submit to you in all areas of our life. Let us give complete control over to you. May we practice and put in place a life of your wisdom. Lord, I thank you for our great salvation. I thank you for giving us the ability to seek you, to serve you, and to love you. Lord, break our hearts in any area where we may not be where you'd want us to be. May we submit all of ourselves to you. Lord, if there's those here today who are in broken relationships, Lord, let them look inside their own hearts and let them yield to your spirit and yield to your wisdom and let them become a peacemaker. Let them be seen with you living through them. Lord, in our relationships at work, at home, in marriages, in the church, may everything we do bring glory to you. May everything we do bring honor. May all the light shine right down on you. May we win people to you. May we share you and live for you in a pleasing way. Lord, I just look forward to the fact that we have this opportunity. Let us take it. Let us choose it as we grow ultimately in intimacy with you. For Lord, you said you will come and make your home with us. May that be the case. In your precious name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen.